Hi guys and welcome to the second part of God Blight. Well, you can say spoiler review discussion of the most interesting points of the book. So yesterday we had an extensive overview, uh, you know, about what happened with Gilliman and basically some very interesting stuff about the Emperor. And now we're going to get to the very end of the book the fight and not only the fight because the fight itself is just well it's a fight between two primark primarchs uh, but uh, we're going to get to actually what Gilliman experienced right from the book and then how he was brought back to life so those two moments and I'm going to try to keep it as tight as humanly possible we're going to hear the book once again and I'm going to discuss but definitely if you have read the book or if you don't care about spoilers you can go and check uh, you know yesterday's stream because there was really really awesome things that uh, I was able to extract from the book and we discussed here live so it's really great stuff guys so this novel you can say is uh, one of the most substantial novels that we had when it comes to 40k lore in recent years and from it I'm pretty sure some amazing things will come out considering where the story could go from here. So now I saved once again the last um, few, you know, few moments. We're going to hear them and I'm going to stop in particular points where it's interesting and we're going to discuss so hi to everybody in the chat hi to of course my primarchs dear Clayton, ivy dark hi to you too and thank you very much ivy for sharing the, uh, the link from yesterday now um i'm very happy that i was able to come back uh, today and you know as i promised basically but that that wasn't for sure but it's a good thing to get this uh, novel out of the way and after that I really have to see with what book I'm gonna continue whether that's going to be the Horus Heresy or mm, you know the previous two novels of the series the Dark Imperium I know what's happening into them but that doesn't mean that I should not you know personally get familiar with them so there's that but it's important that I know what happened there so <laughs> okay uh, we are starting guys so listen carefully, and let's see where I should stop this. Lord of Ultramar, savior, hope, failure, oh. teen, praise, praise. Okay, I think I just went a bit further here where I saved this, so I have to go back. Triumph, failure, loss, and potential. There was no one face among all the faces, no one voice. But yeah. a chorus. A okay, that's very, very important part. Okay, let's see where it starts. I don't know why my note, how it's called here in the app, is so far away, but uh, we are close. Jin Valoris bade the great doors open. His words were a jaunt was pure. Mortarian gasped in discomfort, and Gilliman felt a little hope. He remembered. He relived. He had gone in to see what his father had become. Gilliman had been thousands of years dead. He had spent subjective years lost in the warp to come to terror, only to find an empire of ruin laid starkly before his disbelieving eyes. Yeah, so a bit of a context first, or to remind you guys, that uh, this is the point where he is already, I mean, Gilliman is already injected with the god blight, so the poison is killing him in the most... Uh, <laughs> worst ways possible, killing his body and his soul at the same time, agonizing, agonizing, sorry, pain, all of those things that you cannot imagine are happening with Gilliman. So here's uh, he is in extreme suffering that no mortal can imagine. Okay. Believing eyes, all building to this fateful moment. There was light and fury, a radiance that passed through the bones and burned at the soul. Endless sound that filled eternities. There were the wordless screams of the psychers drained to feed his terrible majesty. There were visions of gods and demigods, of a brown-skinned man of calm expression, clad in skins, clad in mail, 
clad in clothes of all colours and bewildering variety, clad in armour of gold. He had many faces, all proud, all betrayed. He saw Malkador in him, the first regent. He saw his brothers. A million ideas battered him, memories from tens of thousands of years of existence. Random, circular trains of thought, obsessions, predictions and fears. So many voices, all the same, all different, none coherent. He saw a dusty room, titanic in scale, crammed with machinery of awful purpose, the living dying in relay to sustain this monstrous thing. The centre was a machine of gold, shrouded in the dust of broken dreams. A skull-faced cadaver, all life gone, perched within its seat. But then the vision flickered, and he saw a king of infinite power resting a while upon his throne to think. Yeah, okay, so let's unpack that part. Uh, and thank you, dear Kaiton, for, you know, your lovely uh, info. <laughs> because it's very important if the stream runs good. So... Uh, basically, he is experiencing a ton of things. Uh, I think that some of that is him, entirely him. And the, the travel that his soul is experiencing. I mean, his soul is like traveling through the warp in a way and through all of those experiences that are like memories. Uh, and he gets to live, live them. Yeah. And at the same time, the Emperor starts to sneak in and to get in contact with him on some level. On some level. So, let's continue. While upon his throne to think, only lost to his... Oh, that's the app stopping. Only lost to his subjects for a while. And when done with his meditation, he would rise and rule justly. He saw a tired man who would be his father, giving him grave counsel he could not hear. Okay, listen to that part real quick. Not well. The center was a machine of gold, shrouded in the dust of broken dreams. A skull-faced cadaver, all life gone, perched within its seat. But then the vision flickered, and he saw a king of infinite power resting a while upon his throne to think, only lost to his subjects for a while. And when done with his meditation, he would rise and rule justly. He I mean, pay attention to how this is written. So, you know, if, um, if you dream about something and you know what is implied within a particular dream. If you're, let's say, in a room and two people are talking, this is just an example. It could be absolutely any situation that you could be in in a dream. And let's say those people are talking, but you you cannot hear what they are talking about, but you know very well that they are discussing a particular thing and they are either aware of you or not. But the point is that you know everything without words. So you know what is implied and you're getting information without hearing any words. So that is how this is written in the same way that basically to Gilliman is implied that uh, well, this is uh, this, uh, you know, this king god on the troll on the throne, sorry, and he is uh, He will rise and he will do this. I mean is is implied that that is how he feels that it is That is what he gets his information without hearing any words. So he is just there and he already uh, receives this information naturally like is that telepathically per se is just seamlessly yeah that's basically what this is it's a seamless transition or transition is not the right word basically seamless communication without any verbal words needed that is it's just very interesting because the way that they uh, have written this it's pretty awesome <laughs> I mean it's just really great and it switches between that and literal descriptions from the outside so it switches between how Gilliman experienced things how you know this information seamlessly is uh it's been relayed to him and then it switches to like direct um basically detailed explanations of what he is experiencing so you have these two ways of 
presenting what he is going through in this moment. Lastly, he saw a tired man who would be his father, giving him grave counsel he could not hear, telling him what he must do. Again, his view changed, and he saw an evil force to rival the great powers of chaos. He saw sorrow, triumph, failure, loss, and potential. There was no one face among all the faces, no one voice, but a chorus, a cacophony. The Empress' presence was a hammer blow to his soul, a tremendous scouring of being. He could not stand before it and fell to his knees, though Valoris remained silent by his side, as if nothing had happened. He was in the dust of a corpse king's court. He was before a resplendent emperor for all ages. Father, he said, and when he had said that word, it was the last time he had meant it. Okay. There's a lot of things here as well. I mean, he's basically experiencing the emperor. He's not only being in his presence, he's, he's having this... I mean, the being of the emperor, all of it is an experience and it's like extremely strong for him. Um, and he sees the negative, he sees the positive, he sees everything and he assimilates everything at the same time as it's happening. That is also a reflection of how the emperor is in terms of how he exists at this moment because he doesn't have the consciousness that he had when he was alive so to speak in his physical body or all, all of that he is now in another level of consciousness experiencing the suffering of the golden throne experiencing his uh, his weight on his shoulders you know the imperium uh, pushing back chaos uh, navigating the astronomical I mean there's a lot of things that on his shoulders in terms of uh, you know obviously uh, what he has to do to keep chaos at bay somehow and not vaporizing in the same time so uh, for thousands of years you could think that he is not one with himself and he would be really chaotic and he has to make a ton of effort to concentrate somehow a cohesive thought so he can you know send that to Gilliman and actually communicate his intent and he has to isolate that intent uh, towards Gilliman and to convey that somehow but it's a uh, it's a ton of chaos in his own head as well but totally not intended but it is so Gilliman is feeling all of that in this kind of a state of being where they are both basically communicating with their souls, their inner beings, not with their bodies, they're experiencing this other ways of um, literal, like perfect ways of communication where two beings are just like blended with themselves and that is establishing this uh, perfect like equilibrium you can say uh, of communication that is just not possible on a physical level so that is how Gilliman is getting everything which includes the chaos that uh, the emperor is experiencing and what he is what uh, he does there's just a lot of things to that and it's all at once hitting him so that, that is still overwhelming of course for him because he have not experienced anything like this and not only that this type of a communication is new to him but uh, it's about the emperor the emperor is the one being that is doing that um, and Gilliman is doing that communication with him so that is even a lot more to the 10th degree what he would experience if he were to communicate with someone else this way so it's even like nuclear <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, in a nuclear way, this is very strong for Gilliman. It's a good thing he's a Primarch, so he can actually assimilate something from it, but okay, let's go. He had meant it. Blended and fell to his knees, though Valoris remained silent yeah. by his side, as if nothing had happened. He was in the dust of a corpse king's court. He was before a resplendent emperor for all ages. Father, he said. And when he had said that word, it was the last time he had meant it. Father, 
I have returned. Gilliman forced himself to look up into the pillar of light, the screaming of souls, the empty-eyed skull, the impassive god, the old man, yesterday's saviour. What must I do? Help me, father. Help me save them. In the present, in the past, he felt Mortarian's wordless presence at his side, and felt his fallen brother's horror. He looked at the Emperor of Mankind and could not see. Too much, too bright, too powerful. Oh, Jesus. There are so many things here. <laughs> I either have to speed things up because, yeah, I'm not gonna go to bed anytime soon. So let's go back just a bit. Forced himself to look up into the pillar of light, the screaming of souls, the empty eyed skull, the impact. I guess the screaming of souls is all the psychers that are sacrificed for for the god emperor i'm literally just just guessing the eyed skull the impassive god he did say the empty skull the imp father i have returned gilliman forced himself to look up into the pillar of light the screaming of souls the empty eyed skull the yeah so that gives us an idea that yeah the skull is well that he is totally decayed in that part that, not that that is very important, but I do think that there's also a symbolism there. The old emperor, how he was, that will never return. Probably. So, even if we get the emperor in the flesh, he will not be the same anymore. Like, that's for sure, I think. White skull, the impassive god, the old man, yesterday's savior. What must I do? Help me, father. Help me save them. In the present, in the past, he felt Mortarian's wordless presence at his side. I really like how, how it said, word, uh, wordless presence, yeah, because he's talking out of his decaying butt, you know, trying to defend his new master and to uh, do this commercial for him, how amazing he is and all of that. ...at his side and felt his fallen brother's horror. He looked at the Emperor of Mankind and could not see. Yeah, I do think that Mortarian is suffering and he is in some kind of a horror in a way, even though he is not uh, admitting that to himself. Subconsciously, probably his soul is also decaying and in total suffering in some way, shape or form. Because there has to be a price, not only on the physical level, that Nurgle does retract from his... Uh, minions demons whatever he is in some kind of a way taking a lot from them it's not only their physical uh, you know physical beauty and health and all of that i mean obviously they are decaying but they do not feel pain that's um that is additional details the point is he is taking something on the physical and metaphysical level from all of his subjects, demons, no matter how high level they are. And um, that is uh, what this tells me. And of course, we have other details here about Mortarian, that maybe he could be saved, but someday, someday if he decides to uh, get out of, uh, of, you know, the, um, uh, the rulership of Nurgle, he could be saved. So it kind of looks like uh, Mortarian is doing all of this out of spite because he has not found his place in the world and Mortarian seemed like the best idea at the time. And since then he's just repeating to himself that that's just the best thing ever since sliced bread. <laughs> and that is how he is within his grasp and he works for him instead of being a loyal Primarch. But in the minute that he realizes that this relationship is not really working out because he already wants to be above Nurgle, if he could, he would do that, then maybe just maybe there's some kind of a chance for him later on because he is um, a very common case of, how to say this, like a weaker psychology, compensating for something, having complexes, uh, because of someone else and you know trying to put others down because he himself doesn't know how to express what he really wants 
you know from himself and from life and what is his place amongst his brothers um, when you think about how the emperor sees him as his father all those things are just a tons of tons of insecurities that led to the betrayal and what Nurgle presented in his eyes so in that kind of a way uh, you can think of uh, Mortarion as not completely evil but just very confused, uh, insecure and suffering in, in his own way and giving himself to Nurgo seemed like the best deal at the time. Okay. Not see. Too much. Too bright. Too powerful. The unreality of the being before him stunned him to the core. A hundred different impressions, all false, all true, raced through his mind. He could not remember what his father had looked like before, and Rabute Gilman forgot nothing. And then, that thing, that terrible, awful thing upon the throne saw him. My son, it said. Thirteen, it said. Lord of Ultramar, saviour, hope, failure, disappointment. Liar, thief, betrayer, Gilliman. Okay, first it's very cool how how it's described that this awful thing on the throne that was still that was just you know sitting there being like a decoration or something <laughs> just uh, became sentient and looked at him. I mean that's very it's very cool. I can imagine it right away because I've seen this in a lot of other movies how this would look like. So it's gonna be super creepy. Anyway, that's that's just fun to you know to point out. Then he called him a ton of things that are very strange on the surface all those bad things liar betrayer like what the heck emperor <laughs> i mean maybe he knows that Gilliman did his own empire but he didn't know we already discussed this he didn't know that terra did not fall yet so he did what he could and created uh, yeah his own thing and wanted he, he still wanted to go after his uh, traitor brothers and do the best he could. Mm. I mean, those words are maybe from the chaos, chaos mind of the emperor. And by that, once again, I don't mean chaos as the chaos gods. I just mean how he is suffering for so many years, millennials, uh, and uh, a lot of emotions and information about all the events just getting on top of each other so maybe that is uh, what is happening here and of course for us as the reader we have to have something to make us like hmm is the emperor really like he doesn't like Gilliman now but then then all of a sudden he's like well here you're my only savior son so uh, the emperor chosen one he's the one that's worthy of wielding the Emperor's sword. So there's just no doubt that Gilliman is for this job. Continuing. Gilliman. He heard all these at once. He did not hear them at all. The Emperor spoke and did not speak. The very idea of words seemed ridiculous. The concept of them a grievous harm against the equilibrium of time and... time and being. Yes, this is exactly what I meant when I said about how this type of a communication could happen. Psychic communication, you know, when just two beings are in one and they're just exchanging information without any needs of words. So it's described very well here how that's working. So I'm personally impressed by these things because once again, as an author, you have to have a ton of research done on such matters. You know how to write them and how to explain them it's just very well done now i'm gonna get to your comments guys same as yesterday but since it's um uh, you know very late and i don't want to lose my train of thought uh, as i'm getting sleepier close to midnight it's best to use uh, what i can what i still can you know uh, of my mind here and uh, uh, finish with that and then we can discuss real quick and being. Rabute Gilliman. 
The raging tempest spoke his name, and it was as the violence a dying sun reigns upon its worlds. Gilliman! 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 <laughs> the name echoed down the wind of eternity, never ceasing, never reaching its intended point. Kind the of sensation of many minds reached out to Gilliman, violating his senses as they tried to commune. But then one mind seemed to come from the many, a raw, unbounded power, and gave wordless commands to go out and save what they built together. Yes. Again, once again, uh, this is what I was saying about the Emperor trying to focus desperately on one logical, cohesive point so he can communicate what he wants exactly to Gilliman. So that is, mm, that is just makes total sense to me how it's written. That's why he's calling Gilliman Gilliman because he's trying to focus his whole energy towards Gilliman and to communicate with him and that even kind of helps him focus. So there's that. They built together to destroy what they made, to save his brothers, to kill them. Contradictory impulses, all impossible to disobey, all the same, all different. Futures many and terrible race through his mind. The results of all these things, should he do any, all or none of them. Father, he cried. Thoughts battered him. A son, not a son. A thing, a name, not a name. A number, a tool. A product. A grand plan in ruins. An ambition unrealized. Information, too much information, coursed through Gilliman. Stars and galaxies, entire universes, races older than time. Things too terrifying to be real, eroding his being like a storm in full spate carves knife-edged gullies into badlands. Please, father, he begged. Father, not a father. Thing, 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 the mind said. Oh, Jesus. This is one of the most concentrated parts of, well, this whole event. So I gotta, like, bring it back a little bit before we can d discuss. Other than time, things too terrifying to be information, too much information, a tool, okay. not a son, all or none of them same all different together to destroy what they made to save his brothers to kill them Contra okay contradictory i mean it seems contradict contradictory for sure uh to save his brothers to kill them i mean that is uh, i mean you can say depending on how it happens could be the same thing if he kills them he frees them from whatever demon is holding them, let's say, and maybe their soul goes to the warp and then gets reborn. I mean, you can speculate about that. Uh, and there's always the two natures of the Emperor, one that wants to do good things and one that wants to do good things, but it's like the, you know, <laughs> the road to, to hell is paved with good intentions. So there's a lot of conflicting... Uh, nature, I mean, two conflicting natures in the Emperor himself, how he wants to do things, and having been suffering for so long, he should be in some kind of a way negative about it and what's the right thing to do, how he should feel. He is conflicted within himself, like that's 100%. In some kind of a capacity, he has to be conflicted within himself. Them. Contradictory impulses, all impossible to disobey, all the same, all different. Futures many and terrible race through his mind. I think that uh, this uh, part where he says all impossible to disobey, the Emperor is pretty much... Um, uh, how to explain this? He is uh, over Gilliman, like he is trying to possess him. So he is possessing him in a way and imposing his will on him as he tries to convey what he wants. He is so strong in his will and desire to convey what he wants to to Gilliman that it feels like a possession and Gilliman feels compelled and he just takes this information and he feels like he just has to do it, whatever it is, no matter if it makes sense or not. 
he doesn't process this with his intelligence he just takes it and he assimilates it with his being so he just takes it as it is as, as a pure intent and emotion so it's uh, yeah very much like a possession in that moment in particular race through his mind the results of all these things should he do any all or none of them father he cried thoughts battered him a son not a son a thing a name not a name a number a tool and all of that is true i mean he is a number number 13 primarch uh, he's a tool <laughs> for the emperor to you know to uh, successfully hopefully uh, do his will or not hopefully i mean it depends on how the story goes and a son and not a son he's he did not made him in the traditional way and at the same time he did made him uh with and um, with a particular intent and purpose so all of that is true in some capacity a tool a product that too a grand plan in ruins that an too. ambition unrealized that too information too much information coursed through Gilliman. Stars and galaxies, entire universes, races older than time. I think that with the races and all, all of that information about the galaxies, that is just what the Emperor has in him as an experience, information, uh, that it, alls, it all goes back to his nature and uh, what he is as a being. Uh, if he is really created... Uh, from all those shamans and their information and then of course uh, he lived so many thousands of years he gathered a lot of information from the chaos gods too and who knows from where else so he knows a ton of things and he carries that with him in his whole being and he is just transmitting that whether that is willingly or not but he just makes Gilliman experience him fully like Gilliman is the emperor. That is this type of communication that is going on here. It's so completely one. I mean, they're so one in that moment that he, I mean, Gilliman just experiencing everything that is the emperor. Older than time, things too terrifying to be real, eroding his being like a storm in full spate carves knife-edged gullies into badlands. Please, father, he begged. Father, not a father. Thing, thing, thing. Yeah, yeah, thing, thing, thing. So, <laughs> so yeah, Gilliman is trying to say stop, uh, stop and focus. Yeah, I mean, concentrate your energy, uh, stop spilling out all of, all of this and just focus, you know, and tell me what you want from me because... This is um, literally very tiring. I mean, very tiring is like ridiculously understating how this could feel, but it's basically like frying your nervous system 10 times over and yeah, to the point where you're frying physically almost so, or fully in the world of Warhammer uh, 40k. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Thing, thing, the mind said. Apotheosis. Victory! defeat choose it said fate future past renewal despair decay and then there seemed to be focusing as of a great will exerting itself not for the final time but nearly for the final time yeah exactly a great will exerting itself yeah, I think that he's just drawing things uh, at the wall to this point. I mean, he is speaking about what what it was, what it could be. And it could be either good or, or bad and all of those things could be present in the future, the decay, you know. And he also seeing these things happen, you know, while he, he is in the Golden Throne. So it's like he's saying, choose Gilliman, what's gonna be, what is gonna be. Uh, and all of it's in, I mean, all of the future, all, all of that, it could happen is in flux. So things have to happen uh, in a very, very potent way. So this could be changed. The final time, a sense of strength failing, a sense of ending, 
Far away, he heard arcane machines whine and screech, close to collapse, and the clamour of screams of dying psychers that underpinned everything in that horrific room, rising higher in pitch and intensity. Gilliman! The voices overlaid, overlapped, became almost one, and Gilliman had a fleeting memory of her sad face that had seen too much, and a burden it could barely countenance. Gilliman, hear me. My last loyal son. Finally. My pride. My greatest triumph. How those words burned him. Worse than the poisons of Mortarian. Worse than the sting of failure. They were not a lie. Not entirely. It was worse than that. They were conditional. Yeah, basically, Emperor, the Emperor finally focused himself and got to that point. And yeah, I mean, he just put a ton of burden onto Gilman officially. So yeah, of course, that that's gonna feel not, not only because of the experience that this information is being conveyed to Gilman, but it's, uh, it's a heavy burden in any case. He's the only living freaking Primarch. I mean, others could be somewhere, but until we know where, you can say that he's like the only freaking son here. Additional. My last tool, my last hope. A final drawing in of power, a thought expelled like a dying breath. Gilliman. It felt to Gilliman like his mind had exploded. There was a blinding flash, and the king, and the corpse, and the old man overlaid and overlapped, dead and alive, divine and mortal, all judged him. Gilliman staggered from the throne room. Valoris stared into the heart of the Emperor's light unflinchingly a moment longer, then turned away and followed. They emerged days later, though only seconds had passed. Gilliman could not be sure of anything that had happened. When asked later, Valoris said he saw nothing but light and had heard nothing, and that nobody had heard anything from the Emperor since he had taken to the Golden Throne thousands of years before. But he said he had seen Gilliman speak, as if deep in discussion, and although Valoris could not hear what was discussed, Gilliman seemed serene and firm, that he had not seen him fall or plead. Every time he remembered, it was different. Was any of it real? He did not know. He would never know. The moment fled back into the past where it belonged. Gilliman's body slammed into wet soil. He was dying again. His soul clung on, but that too was being eaten alive by Mortarian's plague. Yeah. Well, to me this was uh, well, total, totally what uh, is supposed to happen, so it did happen. Uh, but when he, when he is getting back into his own body, the perception of all of that just totally changes because he is now in his mortal shell, so it's just not gonna be the same in any case so it's normal for him to feel like what well, what was that you know that's perfectly normal perfectly normal arian's plague footsteps halted by his head there was a poke on the breastplate of the armor of fate gilliman heard mortarian speak but he could not see and he could sense nothing else but pain do you see gilliman you follow the wrong master said mortarian he is a cyst, a pus-filled canker surrounding a dead thing lodged in the fabric of reality. Oh, come on. He's gonna talk about cysts <laughs> when he is like a walking one, <laughs> literally, along with his freaking god. There are, you know, cysts and other horrible things combined together. So I don't know if he should be the one to call anybody <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, let's take a pause so I can check your comments, guys, because this is as long as it is. And uh, oh, I'm getting sleepier, damn it. And, uh, you know, this was like uh, the meat of things. Of course, we have some more, but this was the most important part, I think. So uh, you can say I finished this part of my thought. Hi to Apple. I saw you there, Mattie. Uh, Jack too. Oh, let me just go back a bit to catch up. 
Um, oh, well, that's very a uh, good point here. Yeah. We all need some fantasy. Uh, from time to time, all, all the time. All the time is good, <laughs> if you ask me. Well, uh, Matty Magnus, um, I mean, there's a few Primarchs that could be saved, for sure. But the fact that the Emperor talked in this manner, you know, that basically Gilliman is the one, the last, and all those things, his last hope. If uh, the other Primarchs were somehow existing or alive, wouldn't... I mean, wouldn't the Emperor know about that? He should know, he should feel their souls. Unless, of course, there's some other explanation, but for the moment it seems like no Primarchs are returning. In the same time, there are some rumors that some Primarchs are returning. But some other rumors are just so extremely exaggerated and based almost on nothing that um, we, we, we don't know. I mean, Games Workshop, they can decide whatever they decide. I'm pretty sure they have some interest to bring the Primarchs back, but they also maybe want uh, for the story to have some stakes, so, so you know, for us not to think that uh, no matter who he dies, who he dies, no matter who dies, anybody can return. That's not Marvel. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe, maybe they will not return. Who knows, guys? I would not, like, say anything that, uh, I mean, definitively, because that would be stupid. I, I, I don't know. I'm not a psychic. I don't know what they're going to write or decide in the future. Just for the time being, judging by what the Emperor is saying and how the story is shaping, kind of looks like that Gilliman is going to be the only Primarch for quite some time. The only loyal Primarch, I mean. Okay. <sighs> oh, absolutely everybody are fascinated, fascinating in their own way. Every race, chapter, whatever it is, it's fascinating. That's not exactly the case, Matty. I don't think that he just gave up. How, how he is... Um, I mean, he is sustaining humanity to a very big capacity with uh, guiding the uh, you know the astropaths with the beacon you know um, damn it I, I I said it before 15 minutes but uh, as it's getting closer to midnight I'm starting to have few names out of my head which is normal for me. But yeah, and the Astronomicon. So if he were to give up, he would just like, uh, well, die <laughs> and leave the throne. Oh, or he is held by the technology somehow and he cannot, which for his power, that kind of would seem ridiculous to me. If he cannot just break free from that and, I mean, get out of his mortal show, if he really wanted to. Uh, of course, then in that same book, it said that he is preparing for his return and he just needs Gilliman to push things in the direction that they're supposed to be pushed so he can be ready when the time comes. So that is how, I mean, fast forward to the end of the book, that is how things look like at the moment. Uh, still checking what you wrote. And, you know, when I mean, when you talk about the Emperor, you have to say so many things about his agendas, and I already talked about all of that. Uh, some some people in the comments actually uh, reached the same conclusions as I did, which really surprised me. I mean, it's great, but it really surprised me, because I kind of start thinking that there's only people that, that think that, you know, the Emperor is like the holy mother of god <laughs> you know what i mean uh there's i don't think there's like a equivalent uh equivalent to that in english but you know in in my language there's uh, something um that we call holy water untouched which means 
that someone is so holy that they could do no wrong, which with the emperor just not the case. So uh, it's a very deep, deep, deep topic, which I already got into too many times. So I'm not gonna get get into that. Mm, but I don't think that he gave up on humanity in this literal sense. Mm, I mean he still has an interest to the very least even if he doesn't have any love for humanity he still has some interest in it and pushing back chaos because that's also tied to his own freaking existence so yeah <laughs> there's that i mean whether his intentions are mostly pure or not he does he is not just like taking his hands off humanity for sure not Ah, uh, let, let me just focus for a bit. Oh, don't care. So, I have a question for everyone. If one of the traitor Primarchs could have slayed a loyalist, what Primarch would you have wished to stay loyal? That's a very good question. Mm, let me answer it myself. I mean, let me think about it. So, huh... If one of the traitor Primarchs could have slayed the Lois, which what Primarch would you have wished to stay loyal? <sighs> well, I personally really want Magnus to have stayed loyal because he was a bit, you know, misunderstood before he did that with the Web Webway project. He just wanted to practice his powers, uh, which led to his deformities. But if he were to have enough information how to do those things correctly from his father, <laughs> if his father were to pay more attention to that because Magnus has psychic powers, the second most strong, I mean the strongest, I think he was the second strongest psyker. Malkador too, but he's, uh, you know, Magnus is obviously a Primarch, so I would think he's, uh, he's stronger than, uh, you know, uh, than Malkador, if the Emperor w were to put effort into teaching like you're teaching, you know, martial art or whatever else it could be, his sons and Magnus so they can reach their full potential, Magnus can reach his full potential and learn how to learn how to control his powers and his understanding of the warp, none of this would have happened, probably. Because Magnus would not act in this careless way because he didn't know what he actually was doing. Um, another topic. But yeah, uh, my answer is definitely Magnus. I think he has a lot of potential that could be used in a very good way against Chaos. But now we were never know, maybe. Uh... And Jake, hi to you too. Ah, oh, you also said Magnus because of TTS. Well, TTS made Magnus such a great character. He's so fun. He's so fun. A jerk, uh, especially to, uh, you know, the lovely Custody. But <laughs> he's so fun. Yeah, well, Dorn could be very much that, although they're writing the stories in such a way that it's a mystery for a reason. So they can have open ends. It's a big universe, actually it's a freaking huge universe, and you do have to have this loose end so you can have an option and creativity to take from one loose end and extend that and not extend another one and all of that is just gives them a creative freedom so Dorn could be dead or not dead and his hand is forever somewhere for a relic in any case maybe he's gonna grow a new one no i'm, I'm kidding he's not a lizard but <laughs> maybe they're gonna give him like a iron fist <laughs> iron arm and it's gonna be just perfect poetic uh, in the end uh. Yeah, the Emperor is perpetual, but maybe the Golden Throne himself, himself, 
the golden throne itself is stopping him somehow to regenerate and he keeps uh, the emperor in this state that is speculation that a lot of people have reached through the years my personal opinion is somewhere there i mean i can't be sure so yeah you can't really say you have to think like the writers that is what i always try to do uh, and i'm pretty sure they're going somewhere with this because once again according to this book we are still on this book he is preparing to return so that means that he is recovering in a way but in what way is he just gonna manifest another physical body out of thin air with his energy and concentrate that energy into a physical body and just leave the skeleton in the throne we don't know but uh <sighs> i mean vulcan is still dead so there's that and he is a perpetual he's not the emperor and maybe he could still be back because of his nature somehow some way but yeah <sighs> whatever you hear it could be other way around just keep that in mind because as i said people are speculating all the time as uh, i mean i myself you know when i'm watching 40k content and i'm clicking on a video you know to see if i'm not like up to date or something i'm clicking on the video i'm not gonna name names but clicking on a video and it is this is you know very amazing and this is shocking or this is whatever and it's like such a speculation based on breadcrumbs of information and they're trying to make news out of that so i'm not very fond of this idea it's like 10 15 20 minutes of nothing like trying to create a story around this much of information and maybe this and maybe that and maybe this and all of a sudden it's like almost another topic now so i wouldn't hold my breath on any of those things what i can do and i am doing is analyzing this information here and how it's presented from the points of the of the writers as much as possible and from that i can draw some conclusions and in time just see if uh, i hit something on the head or not you know a lot of things that i did say even before i read a lot of the books were you know correct very much so or they are confirmed in exactly the way that i thought that they are going to be so who knows maybe i will hit something maybe i will not hit something but whatever the case may be um, i'm not in any way um, I, I'm literally actually impartial and not biased towards whatever storyline as long as it's like meaningful makes sense I'm all up for it just surprise us what I would say like uh, let them surprise us just make it um, make it good again make the Imperium good again they want to keep it dark because it's the 40k but uh, I, I do want to see something like a light at the end of the tunnel with the Emperor because when you bring him back, hopefully, a lot of things could happen and you can still have the end this war. But then if you bring another Primarch, it just new age of the Imperium could begin. And I think that's going to be fascinating as well. So if they really, really want to not drag this out, and not make a ton of novels and just nothing really happening that's not very compelling to me so i'm happy that with godlight you have something that is very major event major fight between the primarchs major destruction and defeat of freaking primarch and that is of course mortarian and major ascent to gilliman as a primarch and appearance of the emperor so that is like the first novel uh, in which something major happens and that actually we now have something to look forward to for real because from here on out stuff should be happening so i'm excited about that and i was thinking when i reached the end of the book 
few things that also transpired at the end of the book, Gilliman talking with an AI and asking the AI what the AI thinks about the Emperor. That was very funny, but interesting, but interesting. Uh, and just, well, it, it, it's just awesome. Um, what Gilliman maybe is going to do now, going to Terra, and the possibilities are just interesting. And all of those, uh, you know, um, lords, snobby, snobby, <laughs> sleazy lords of Terra that wants the power so bad, how he's gonna probably put them in their place. I, I just love to read that, you know, listen to that in the audiobook. Okay, uh, guys, you first. So I'm gonna get back to your comments, but we have to continue here because it's almost midnight. Reality, like a thorn or a piece of shrapnel. It must be drawn out for things to heal. Do you understand now that this is what you follow? Mortarian grunted in amusement. Of course, you can't answer. I doubt you understand anyway. There was the sound of Mortarian shifting his stance. A wistful tone entered his voice. We will soon be in the garden of Nurgle, my brother. Yeah, it's just basically Mortarian just gloating uh, of the situation. Uh, let's check this. Lord of Ultramar, savior, hope, failure. Yeah, I don't know what happened with the app, but it didn't hit what I wanted to hit, but we still got the points. Okay, last one. I twitched. The armor of fate and the creatures that dwelt there set up a cacophony of cries and moans. On the areas of Ajax that it overlaid, reality trembled and reasserted itself, and the garden began to fade. Impossible, Mortarian whispered. The corpse of his brother twitched. The armor of fate was a corroded shell, but somehow its power pack restarted and lights blinked on systems all over it. Gilliman's blackened face turned up to look at him. Mortarian felt something huge and dangerous moving through the warp. Something he had not felt for a long time. Gilliman's back arched. The armor was humming now, giving off a psychic signature as arcane mechanisms within it powered on throughout. The earth shook again. A second toll of the unseen bell sent the denizens of the garden into panic. Trees cracked as they dragged up roots and attempted to lumber away. A million kinds of demon fly buzzed up from the corpse grounds and flew off in gathering swarms. Nurglings shrieked and waddled as fast as their little legs would carry them. Mortarian stood hurriedly, raised silence, and made to bring it down to destroy Gilliman finally, take his soul as a sacrifice to the great god Nurgle, even if he could not take his worlds. But he could not move. Gilliman's eyes were glowing with pure white power. Ah, that's just amazing. So this is this is the cool moment in the end where Gilliman is Coming back to life, the Emperor is moving through the warp, he's empowering Gilman, healing him, every demon, everything that is disgusting is just moving away and even freaking uh <laughs> freaking disgusting Primark, Mortarian is like free freeze frozen, yeah. He's just frozen as he stands. It's just awesome moment, I love it. It's power. The last slimes of nerves their thinking. little legs would carry them. Yes. Mortarian stood hurriedly, raised silence, and made to bring it down to destroy Gilliman finally, take his soul as a sacrifice to the great god Nurgle, but even if can't. he could not take his worlds. But he could not move. Gilliman's eyes were glowing with pure white power. The last slimes of his decayed flesh burned away, and a network of feathery capillaries spread in their place, bearing new blood unsullied by the god blight. The metal of the armor of fate shimmered, impossibly remaking itself. Bright decorations appeared as tarnish cracked and fell away. Wires grew and reconnected as surely as Gilliman's skin was growing back. Amazing. The neverground of the garden shook hard. Demons large and small were screaming, emerging from their hiding places and fleeing in riotous stampede. Away in the distance, ever visible wherever you went in the garden, Nurgle's black manse shivered, and Mortarian felt another presence, as powerful as the first, looking at him from behind its ever-shuttered windows. The ground cracked and broke. Glaring whiteness blazed from the crevasses. 
Gilliman's corpse rose up and hung in the air, supported by a pillar of radiance, and slowly turned so he was upright. He reached out, and the Emperor's sword appeared in his hand, and burned with the fires of a thousand suns. He speaks to me, brother, said Rabute Gilliman. He does not speak to you. The unbearable radiance enfolded Gilliman, so glaring, Mortarian threw up his hands. Father, Mortarian said, oh. and his voice quailed like a little boy discovered in the course of some small but unforgivable crime. I am his right hand, brother, said Gilliman. I am his general, his champion. I am the avenging son. By his might am I preserved. The landscape flickered between the blasted battlefield of Ajax and the garden of Nurgle. The ground of the garden was rolling. This is impossible. You should be dead. There was the creak of a door, faint but portentous, coming from the manse. The doors never opened to Nurgle's house. Mortarian turned very, very slowly and looked to the great house. A single tiny shutter on an insignificant gable was open, a square of deeper blackness in the black wood. Forgive me, Grandfather, he quailed. Gilliman looked past him, and something looked through him, seeing all worlds at once. Eyes as bright as the centers of galaxies stared at the black, forbidding house. You are a traitor. Gilliman said, in a voice that was not quite his own. You have brought low all that could have been, but you are as much a victim as a monster, Mortarian. Yes. So when I said possession, it is still present. So yeah, in order for the Emperor to heal Gilliman in such capacity, bring him into the air, uh, the sword appearing in his hand, light him, you know, like... Um, Damn it, I mean, I mean, how was the word for that? Uh, okay, I like glowing from, uh, you know, from Gilliman. That is the Emperor, right there. I mean, Gilliman is also conscious of this, but uh, I think that he and the Emperor, Gilliman and the Emperor, became one, you know, similar to how they were communicating, communicating earlier, but now they're became becoming sorry becoming one and the emperor speaking through him so it's just awesome it's amazing i just love that because i can freaking imagine every frame of this if we if it was a movie i can imagine it it's just amazing how it looks in my head i wish i could project it to you so you can see how that looks but it's awesome perhaps one day you might be saved until then you must go back to the master you chose no! Mortarian cried, but it was too late. Some force reached for him and yanked hard. He flew back over and over through the garden towards the black house of the plague god. He felt a moment of perfect terror before he flew in through the open portal and it slammed shut behind him, trapping him with an altogether more awful god. Nurgle was displeased. Gilliman looked over the garden of Nurgle. He was between two worlds. The warp was a shifting thing, never constant. The garden was a collection of ideas. It had no true form, and through it he could see a million other worlds that underpinned it, the dreams of souls living and dead, and past that, as if glimpsed through banks of glittering sea mist that evaporated before the morning sun, the battlefield of Ajax. Hear me! Gilliman's voice boomed through eternities. The sword blazed higher until the fire of it threatened to burn out time. Wow. I am Rabute Gilliman, last loyal son of the Emperor of Terror. It is not your destiny to end today, God of Plague, but know that I am coming for you, and I will find you, and you will burn. Yes, that's so awesome, just badass. Just want to say one thing. I'm really happy that they said uh, to go back to, you know, one more awful god. Because, yeah, which implies that the Emperor is a god now, at least. And that Nurgle is worse. 
which of course he is worse of course he is worse okay burn he gripped the sword of the emperor two-handed and raised it high rising waves of fire ripped into the garden from the great man's a cry of rage sounded as a wall of flame hotter than a million suns devoured everything in its path finally breaking and receding within yards of the black walls of nurgle's house its infinite halls shook mossy tiles fell from the roof sodden timbers steamed this is a warning the warp and the materium were once in balance for too long you have tipped the scales understand that it is not only the warp that is capable of pushing back this realm is not real only will is real and none may outmatch my will be assured lord of plagues and convey this message to your brothers that i do not speak for myself i speak for the emperor of mankind then he was falling 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 forever until his knee hit the ground and he woke into reality once more. Gilliman opened his eyes. He was kneeling on the ground of Ajax. The sword of the Emperor was buried, point down in the cracked earth. Its fires had turned everything around him to glass. Burnt-out suits of armor lay around him. Only he was untouched. Mortarion was nowhere to be seen. He stood. Whatever presence had inhabited him was gone. The air was clean. Yeah, like I said, whatever presence, yeah, the Emperor inhabited him, all of that happened. Uh, it's just amazing. It's just awesome. And you know how he can perceive the warp and see all of those things, just assimilate them. And how he, you know, said those awesome badass words and gave a warning. This world is not real. Only will is real. Actually... This could be taken basically that will is stronger than whatever the warp is in that kind of a way. If you can understand it in this way, you know, will can re rewrite whatever the warp is. So that is what he means when he says that the warp is not real. Will is, uh, is real because it can just evaporate whatever the warp is. Yeah, I mean... The warp is is real when it comes to the warp itself, but if you are the freaking emperor and you do have the will, you can make so that all of that disappears. So it's amazing, and I mean on the on the topic of will, you can talk a lot just on that because willpower when it's in the context especially of psychic spiritual all that powers is a difference between being in control when you're not in the material body and not being in control of your surroundings yourself and what do you want to well do go uh, powers that you can attract or not it's a complicated uh, thing topic but uh, that is making total sense once again so bravo to the writers for doing a lot of research i guess air was clean there was no sign of taint nearby and he knew that the emperor's sword had burned the god blight away yeah natasa's psychic shield still limbed the dueling ground but through it he could see clearing skies and clouds heat shocked by lance fire a ferocious orbital bombardment was laying waste to Mortarion's army, which retreated, leaderless and outmatched, under the cover of poisoned fogs. Yes, so that was that. I mean, there's a few more things uh, at the end of the book, like I said, this conversation with the AI. Uh, but that's like another topic on, uh, on its own about the future of where things are going, like I mentioned. But it's just awesome, like imagine this in animation this whole possession thing and how all the god blight was also obliterated and just the sword and all the power that manifested it's awesome so they are promising here big things that the emperor is returning somehow some way and he is coming with the vengeance and there's just nothing that can stand in his way when he has all of that will power and imagine how much will power he he must have because to to be in existence and be stronger 
and probably I mean getting stronger with time you know trying to sustain the astronomical and all of that to keep chaos at some kind of a distance from Terra all of those things that takes so much willpower when you imagine that he is suffering all of these times and he tries to just get his freaking mind together so whatever he's doing we have to give him credit uh, that no other being that was uh, material ever did what he did so there's that i mean the fact that i don't think that he's like super pure or super good or whatever doesn't mean that um in any kind of a way and trying to diminish his power not even a little bit i mean the emperor is obviously crazy powerful but in a way that at least to me from how this is written now especially and how Gilliman spoke when he was possessed just makes sense just makes sense guys so i hope that you could grasp this uh, analysis that i did uh, from you know everything that transpired i'm very very tired from all the talking uh, but i'm gonna check your comments real quick guys and try to get through some of them and uh, yeah it's midnight and eight minutes now so i'm gonna do that quick and after that i'm gonna go as i said if you haven't watched the first stream from yesterday you do see it so you can connect things if you haven't already and i have to go back to the last part of the book because yeah i mean it's it's worth talking for that last part and see you know talk i mean just talk about where things are going like properly talk about where things could go okay reading Well, Jack, I don't think that that's gonna happen, that he's gonna die and the Imperium of Man just gonna cease to exist. I don't think that's gonna happen at all. I mean, obviously, things are not going that direction. Anything can change, as I said, but I just don't think that they're gonna go in that direction. There has to be Imperium of Man, otherwise, how you're going to play the tabletop? You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, a lot of things are coming down to people's armies, and at, at the tabletop and you have to have armies to play with them they have to sell their figures and you have to paint them so all of the novels is uh, for us to give us material to expand the universe and for you to have some kind of a stimulus to play the tabletop so that is where everything comes from in the first place uh, if there's no Imperium and all of a sudden like humans are without their main home i don't think that that's gonna happen at all and not only i mean terra but like the whole human uh, existence in the galaxy that's not going away at all at least that i can say i'm pretty sure about that though well, harry uh i don't think that magnus will have such a role just because the emperor is uh well he's not strong enough to do it himself because he needs gilliman to do it and that is actually what he says later on in, in the end of the book he does say that the emperor is using people to do his bidding he's like a man that's using that's using people so that's why gilliman even tries to diminish him and He's basically saying that his father is not a god because he's act he's acting like a man uh, that is like an after effect of uh, Gilliman's own uh, own feelings on the matter especially when he's not possessed by the Emperor anymore he has his own opinion on what he felt and what he remembered that he felt so those are like some negative emotions right there Anyway, we're going to leave that for that end of the book discussion. Yeah, well, I also watch Luton and uh, Major Kill. Yeah, he is funny. Uh, especially some of the puns that he made. Just hilarious. 
Well, you're well, don't care. You're actually also watching me now, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, okay, Ferris. Le a Resident Evil uh, Extinction. I haven't seen that for a while. But I enjoy all of those movies, uh, no matter how cheesy they are. Okay, Jake. Okay. Oh, exactly. I just love to see how Gilliman is gonna fry their asses. Of the lords, I mean. Uh, that's a very good question, don't care. And it has been discussed multiple, multiple, multiple times. Uh, I do think that it's a bit of both. That is how I think. I mean, from one side, he realized that he needs his children, in this case, only Gilliman. <laughs> uh, because he's the one that is left. I mean, he needs Gilliman to succeed on his mission. For sure, he does need him. He would not bring him back if he didn't. And he made that pretty clear as well. Uh, and he needs him as a tool in terms of the fact that he is his uh, son in a genetic sense. What what to tell you? I mean, to this point, Emperor, the Emperor himself is so fried <laughs> on that miserable existence and still pushing back with his will. I, I don't know if there's like love exactly left in him, more like a spite and sorrow for what has transpired with the heresy. Sorry guys, but if I don't drink water, I'm just gonna be without the voice very soon. So, I'm not sure if he can feel what humans can in terms of affection per se maybe somewhere deep down he has some kind of a sent <laughs> so um, sentimental quality that he assigns to his sons and Gilman but is I, I, I mean I do think that it's more like a means to an end you know like there are two. I mean, he does have some respect for for Gilliman and for his loyal sons. I think because they are mighty and he created them to be mighty. They are also flawed, of course. It's not that not that the emperor is not flawed, <laughs> you know. Mm, so I think there's some kind of a respect there, to the very least. So it's not like he is totally not. Uh, respecting them and just using them literally as tools. That is not the case. He does have some kind of a respect for them. So if it's not love, it's respect. Oh, well, thanks, Ferris. That is extremely flattering to me. But uh, the ASMI question is just because I got that a lot of times and I'm like, okay, let's ask you guys if you want me to try that. And if I try that, it's going to be in maybe like a fun matter. It's not going to be like a professional matter, at least not at the beginning. I don't have the tools for her for that. I just have one mic. If I want to make it a professional, uh, I will need another camera. And just it's going to be absolutely ridiculous what I'm going to need. So... I doubt that I'm gonna get that that far if uh, but if it's like casual for fun and you enjoy it and I'm not gonna make it creepy just gonna make it fun that's my idea to make it fun maybe just maybe I'm gonna do it but of course if you don't watch I'm not gonna do it you know so casually gonna try it maybe and if you like it you like it if you don't I'm just not gonna do it but it's been, it's been, I mean, brought up enough times for me to now consider it. And on the stream, on the first stream, summer gaming, summer gaming show that I did E3 last week, I did it for just like two seconds and it was just very funny. And I enjoyed doing that in just this context of, of comedy and just to see how it sounds. So... For the for the fun of it, for the fun of it, it's not like it's gonna become my regular content. 
you know? Okay, let me assimilate that. Why do I have to think when Gilliman was possessed by the Emperor that his eyes glow like when Ang from Atwa goes into the Avatar state? I haven't watched Avatar, I mean the animation, not the movie. Um, I actually watched the movie, I mean not Avatar James Cameron but the Avatar from the anime. Uh, I watched that too, I mean I watched both but if you're referring to the anime Avatar uh, I only have very like low info about that but you do have to make some kind of a logical uh, association how that would look like and, and and yeah I mean he is glowing and his eyes are glowing oh you cannot wait uh, for what Matty I'm not sure oh oh okay well, thank you Matty I hope so yeah, and Godblight was burnt away, exactly. That was amazing. Oh, Lauhauser, hi to you. Uh, oh, War, Warhub. I'd love a story pitting the will of the Emperor against the will of the Hive Mind. Oh! <laughs> oh my gosh! That's great. That is absolutely great oh that's oh my goodness oh i love that i wow that is what a topic it just floored me here because you know the hive mind is maybe one of the most powerful powerful forces in the galaxy and it looks like to be independent by the warp uh, and like its own thing and we don't know how sentient I mean it, it's supposed to be sentient but mm, we don't know how it will compare with the Emperor so that's amazing and it does have to have some willpower to control so many Tyranids ah that's another topic on its own and a very long one but uh, I gotta put a pin in there so Warhub, that's that's great. Thank you for, uh, for you know, mm, mentioning that. It's just awesome. Okay, reading. Okay, like just during the final battle of the story, he breaks the will of the hive mind, uh, and tames it. Uh, becomes super brass like Spear and Fang from Primal. <laughs> Ah, well, I'm not familiar with that too, haven't seen it, but I, I get your point. I kind of think that's what the Emperor is and and his, his history and the fact that he went through this traumatic experience being on the Golden Throne for thousands of years. kind of think that this is gonna shape him into something, I mean, of a being or of a god that just surpasses... Oh, others just because of the nature of his uh, his learning curve his history what he has to go through to get to this point individual growth uh, basically of um, I mean literally literally what he had to do to be the Emperor what he had to overcome to be the Emperor and how he was embedded to that freaking golden throne and what he had to go through to sustain what he had to sustain so I do think that the whole thing just made him so much more resilient like nothing else in the galaxy because nothing else in the galaxy went through what he went through like there's no equivalent to his experience so that alone could make him the most powerful being no matter in which material or in immaterial uh, worlds both so I, I do think that he would win but I do need to uh, take all the possible facts and break them apart about the hive mind and see how they are compare or could compare if the Emperor comes out at the end alive from this which 
he should have. I'm gonna read that. I'm gonna read that dark. Don't worry. Like I said, I am familiar with what happened before, but uh, personally, I have to get through the novels that uh, uh, you know I did not get through personally. But at least I know what uh, was happening there. So it's not like I don't know. Uh, it's better to get through things in person. That's why I am going through the novels at least those that i can get my hands on it's very important for everyone to you know to experience the novels uh, uh you know literally on their own because when you watch lore videos which i have gone through hours upon hours upon hours of lore videos the creators of course they do put their own thoughts in there like i do and their own opinions and their own dissection of the story and the lore and if you don't get through the lore yourself uh, you can have wrong impressions about some things about some others no but about some other things you can definitely be misled if that particular creator also did not get it or they got it in a different way or presented it in a different way retold it reread it read it only some parts if you don't have the whole context uh, or just something is not interpreted as the way as you would understand it um, it's, it's just not the same and you could be misled to some kind of a, an extent so i for me prefer to get through the information by myself as soon as i can you know before that uh, I can get through it to get, you know, the picture. But then when I get to the book, is like I'm just trans. Uh, how is the word for that? Like yeah, yeah, transported into this world, and I'm experiencing experiencing it the way that it's supposed to be experienced, at least from uh, my uh, philosophical and knowledge. You know point of view so that is you know personal uh, experience with the, with the stories any story for that matter is essential essential so i'm gonna catch up with what i should catch up on <sighs> reading last words so whoever wants to say anything to say it now the minotaurs today i found out uh, about the minotaurs uh, from uh, my discord anyone that is not in discord can always join it's just open to everyone 40k fans so i had this great discussion today uh, with uh, moonlight i think wait i don't want to say the wrong name sorry 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 <laughs> apologies let me go to that topic where we discussed that. What channel was it? That that's a good question. Uh, and then I found out about the the Minotaurs, which are super awesome, badass Spartans like uh, chapter. That's gonna be hard to hit exactly that channel. Damn it! Whenever that was. Oh, there's such a funny memes, <laughs> memes that you guys are posting there. Uh, so funny. There's some about the, I mean, Resident Evil and uh, Lady Dimitrescu is all over the place. No matter if it's a 40k <laughs> a server or Warhammer server, she is there. She just has to be there. There's just no other way around around that what we will do without Ra lady dimitrescu I, I ask and her butt and, and boobs <laughs> she's just awesome okay i'm trying to find that uh, and they they look so badass one of the most uh, f you know uh oh yeah jimmy 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 thank you jimmy so one of the most impressive looking uh, ever chapters that I've seen are exactly the Minotaurs. 
with a very mysterious gene seed. Interesting. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, never mind. Uh, as long as I know who uh, who posted it. Uh, um, okay. I don't know if the names here, your names here, are the same as in Discord. So have that in mind. I I, I don't know if you are. Primer out. Enemy award winning animation by the creator of Samurai Jack. Really? The story of cavemen who forms a ball with a dinosaur and go on adventure. So that sounds interesting. Uh, okay. Sweet dreams. Thank you very much to whoever has my time. Well, okay guys. So as, as always, thank you very much for watching. I do plan to cover the last part of the book. We'll see how that goes. I mean, when that's gonna happen, but uh, I do have it in mind. As always, guys, if you'd like to support me, check out the links down below to my OnlyFans, where I do my meaningful sex educational content, plus fitness, health, nutrition, physique updates, how I, I am progressing in my fitness journey, all of those things. And there's other stuff there, so you can look at them if you like. But with that being said, guys, thank you very much for tuning in. If you have other 40k friends, Warhammer fans, uh, you can recommend the channel if you like to help me, of course. At least you can drop a like. That always helps. So have a great weekend, guys. Kisses and hugs. Until very soon with me, KG Reviews. Bye-bye.